Father, come to you tonight, <clears throat> just to here to worship you. We just ask your blessings on this service tonight. We just pray for those that are unable to be here. Just pray that you be with Omer and <clears throat> Ted with his healing up of his knees. And <clears throat> Father, just pray that you be with each and every one here tonight. Just pray, Lord, that you uh, continue to bless this church. We just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> tonight we're going to be looking at part three of our series here on Genesis chapters 1 through 11. We left off last time. We're starting on verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 26 through 28 if you want to turn there. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now in verse 26, we saw that God creates man. Now man is the pinnacle or top of God's creation, even above angels. The fact that man was God's top creation and the fact that Adam would get dominion over the earth and the animals when Satan wanted that is what made Satan jealous and would lead to his rebellion against God. You know, ultimately, you know, as I mentioned before, many say that Satan rebelled prior to all this. I've already mentioned for a few reasons, I just don't believe that. Number one, I believe that he had to be created in these six days like everybody else because he's a created being. But I also believe that God said everything was perfect. Well, it wouldn't be perfect, in my opinion, if he had already rebelled. Plus, you know, the whole reason why he wanted, you know, he, he had his rebellion is he wanted to be like God. He wanted to be the most high. And he wanted to be worshipped. You know, he didn't like the fact that Adam was given dominion over this. You know, he thought that angels were higher and better than man. Well, initially, in one sense, that is correct. But it doesn't matter. Angels are not made in God's image. Man is. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that ultimately set him off is that man was made in, in God's image, but yet even he, as a mighty angel as he is, was not. And it was Adam who got dominion over the animals and over the earth, not not Satan. And I personally believe that's one of the things mostly that led to his rebellion. And a final factor was the fact that this verse says man was made in the, uh, I read that already, about the image of God, whereas angels were not, including Satan who was an angel. Now Adam was originally to have had dominion over the earth, but after his sin, he lost this, this to Satan. You know, today Satan does have that dominion over the earth. It's, you know, we, we talk about that, you know, when he, uh, he offered, if you remember, he offered all the kingdoms of the earth to Jesus if he would bow down before him. And Satan had that right to do that, because right now, it's because of Adam's sin, this earth does belong to Satan. Now, ultimately, it belongs to God the Father, but he is allowing Satan to have control of it at the, at the time. And right now, he is heavily in control now, as I said, man is made in God's image and is, therefore, he is a triune body just as God is. Now, God is made up of the Godhead, which consists of God the Father, God the Son, or Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Ghost. Now, man has a physical body, and inside is an identical spiritual body, and man also has a soul. So, therefore, man is also a triune body just like the Godhead, you know, which makes sense because we're made in the image of God. Now, 
As I said, we all have a spiritual body. People forget about that. You know, that that's when we die, our spiritual body and our soul is what's either going to go to heaven or to hell. This physical body is just a shell that holds all that. But the, the spiritual body looks exactly like what you see here, the physical body. It's just, yeah, it's, it's eternal, whereas your physical body will die off. If you want to look at, uh, keep, keep your finger there in Genesis, because we're going to be going back there, obviously. But if you want to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And we'll see how Scripture verifies what I was just saying about man having those three parts of the, the body. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So see here, it clearly shows we have the spirit, soul, and body. You know, the spirit is your spiritual body. You know, and the soul, like I said, that's in a, in a part, and then your body is your outer, outer shell. Our physical body, as I mentioned, will die, but our spiritual body and soul will live on forever, either in heaven or the lake of fire, depending on whether a person has trusted in Jesus as their Savior or not. And again, it has to be while they're still alive here on this earth. Once we die, it is too late to choose Jesus. The physical body, as I mentioned, is just the shell for this, the spiritual body and the soul. But the spiritual body is the part that worships God and gets reconnected to God as originally intended before Adam sinned and that connection was severed. When, when Adam sinned, he became spiritually dead. And it's that connection that gets reconnected. You know, we all, everybody still has a spiritual body, but that's the part that we use to worship. And when you get born again, that gets reconnected to, to Jesus. And therefore, you know, we can actually worship, you know. Unbelievers, they still have it, but it's not fully connected in the sense ours is if you're a true born again Christian. You know, they'll still use it to worship, but they're worshiping often, you know, heathen gods and so forth or, or, or so, you know, whatnot. But they don't have that true connection. You know, they don't have a connection with their false gods the way that we have that connection with Jesus if you're a true born again believer. Now, the soul is the real person and contains our conscience. You know, if, if, if it used to be, I don't know if they still do it, but, you know, they oftentimes they used to say, like saying a plane crash or something, or, you know, they'd always say, you know, how many souls were on board? You know, they would say there was 300 souls on board, or they would say, you know, 300 souls perished or something like that. Or whatever. But they'd always, you know, people knew, even, even unbelievers understood that we had a soul. And like I said, that soul is the real you that is your conscience that is that is what makes you 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 unique you know each one of us is different and what we are it's really our soul you know we think it's our our mind or whatever well it is our brain in, in, in essence but really it's your soul that's controlling all of this you know that that's who you really are now man was clearly created on day six we i, I just read that to you and the first man was Adam. Now Jesus confirmed that Genesis was true and an historical fact when he said that Adam was here from the beginning of creation, which debunks that the earth was around for billions of years before man appeared. If you want to turn to Mark chapter 10, verse 6, we'll take a look at that. And in this verse, Jesus himself is speaking. And he's going to show that, that uh, evolution and all this old earth stuff and as I just said, where they say billions of years passed before man appeared, Jesus himself, who is our creator, says that that's not true. Mark chapter 10, verse 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. I mean, it clearly says that man was here from the beginning of the creation. It didn't say billions of years passed off or a buyer or anything like that. Now, yes, there was five previous days 
But that's it. Five little 24-hour days. Now, verse 26 clearly shows the Godhead of Trinity and said, shows that all the Godhead was involved in creation, especially a man when it says, let us make, you know, you can, you can see that if you look at verse 26, back in Genesis, we're back in Genesis, <laughs> on verse 26, it says, uh, you know, God said, let us make man our image and that little word us clearly shows that God is more than one person now many people say that God is not mentioned in the Old Testament yet it is clearly here in the first chapter of Genesis the Godhead is clearly seen in the very in the first very first verse of scripture in, in, in Genesis 1 1 when the Hebrew word for God is Elohim which is plural Showing there is more than one person in the Godhead rather than there being more than one God. There's not more than one. Now, there's only one God. There's not multiple gods, but there's more than one person. If God is singular, so it must refer to the plurality of the Godhead. And that, so the very word, the very Hebrew word Elohim, and that very first verse in Genesis is telling you, as you know, it's mentioning that there's the Godhead. So, you know, again, when people say that there's the Godhead's not mentioned. It's clearly there. Now verse 27 of Genesis chapter 1 says he made people male and female. And as I read, Jesus confirmed this in that first I just read you Genesis chapter, I mean on Mark 10, 6. But also let's look at Matthew 19, 4. That's the parallel verse here. Again, this is Jesus speaking. And it's the parallel verse to what we just read in, in 10, 6. This is Matthew 19, verse 4. <clears throat> and he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? You know, and then back in Genesis, that verse 27, it says, So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So all these verses clearly show that he made male and female. He did not make any other sex as is being falsely taught today. You know, you, many, there's some people claim there's six different sexes. Now, I don't know where they come up with this stuff, but, you know, there's some scientists and some, some uh, these so-called professors and so-called brain people say that there's not two sexes, male and female, but there's in reality six different ones. Now, we're not even going to get too much into that, but you know, every person is, is one or the other. You're either male or female. Not none of the above, as some believe. You know, there's some states, you know, you can put like none of the above or like, you know, on the census and things like that. They're changing all this. Now, people are also not trapped in the wrong body. You know, this is, again, is a lie from Satan. God does not make mistakes. And transgenders who say they are the opposite sex trapped in the wrong body are calling God a liar. And that goes for males that think they're females or females that think they're males. You know, it works both ways. You know, when, and, when, and when a transgender is saying that they're trapped in the wrong body, then they're calling God a liar by doing that. And God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, showing that homosexuality is wrong, as is the whole LGBTQ pride agenda, which is stripped strictly from Satan. Those involved need to repent of their sin and call upon Jesus to save them. Now man was originally, as I mentioned, to have dominion over all of the animals, whether on land, in the water, or in the air. Now I believe that it is possible that animals could originally talk, or else how could would Adam be able to communicate with them to control them? Now, I believe this is why when Satan possessed the serpent and the serpent talked to Eve, she never thought it was strange that the serpent talked to her. You know, if you think about it, it never she never once like, whoa, that serpent just talked to me. I mean, it was, she, it, she never, you know, question. And the thing is, how can Adam have control? Now, I mean, again, I'm not, if someone disagrees with me, that's fine. I'm not going to say scripturally it's in here, but how can you have control of animals? It's like now you have pets. Oh, we, they kind of understand us to a point, but we don't speak cat or dog or, or whatever. 
that you know we don't have full control over them. And again, how could Adam have control if they, they couldn't talk? You know, that's just my opinion. You, you know, but that's up. You know, whatever in my belief. But I do think that might be why she never questioned. You know, why this serpent just talked? Because the serpent always talked. It just wasn't possessed by Satan previously. So you know, it wasn't. And I personally believe that the original language spoken by Adam and Eve was Hebrew, and that is why this language was spoken by God's chosen people. You know, Hebrew is referred to as a pure language, which the original language of man would have been. If you want to turn to Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9, we'll take a look at that. And I'm sure most of you probably don't know where Zephaniah is, but it's in the minor prophets there, so... <laughs> it's near it's near the end of the Bible. Zephaniah chapter three verse nine. It's it, right after you go Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and, and then you got Zephaniah. And it's right before Haggai. If that helps you out. <laughs> I'll give you a second to find that, but yeah, it's right before Haggai. If you can find Haggai, no, it's before Zechariah. Yeah, it's past Hosea. Go past Micah. Okay, in the back, it's right before. So Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. And now if you were to look at those verses in context related to that, then it's referring to Hebrew, you know, that Jesus was basically saying that just like Israel came back, which is what happened when they came back in the land, you know, again, they speak Hebrew again today. You know, for a long time, Hebrew was not spoken by the people. You know, the Jews had been dispersed, and they weren't speaking Hebrew. Even in, even most, a lot of them in Jesus' day didn't speak Hebrew. A lot of them spoke Greek. Now, there's a lot of them that did speak Hebrew, but a lot of them didn't. But, I mean, for the most part, Hebrew came back only recently in the last, you know, our you know, lifetimes and you know, the last hundred years or so. And... You know, that eventually, I believe, during the millennium and all this stuff, you know, eventually everybody's going to speak Hebrew. So if you don't know how to speak Hebrew now, you will someday. <laughs> I believe that, that that will be the one universal language. And I think that originally was the, the language, as I said. That's why God's chosen people, that was the language he had them have. And at the Tower of Babel, when up, while all the languages got dispersed, the pure language stayed with Seth and so forth, you know, went through, uh, you know, what would become the Hebrews, you know, through, through Heber. That's where the Hebrew name comes from. It's from the son of Heber. Now, notice that man was created <coughs> fully developed as an adult and ready to reproduce and could speak from the very beginning, unlike what evolution teaches. You know, I mentioned that about the animals and stuff and plants. They are already ready to bear and reproduce and so forth. Well, man was no different. Man was right off the beginning ready to reproduce and could speak. Where evolution says that man, you know, evolved from apes and so forth. You know, and, and you know, if you go further back, they ultimately came from rock and a bowl of soup. But you know, if you want to believe what they say, but. Uh, you know, clearly man could speak from the very beginning. I mean, even that the serpent, you know, had this conversation with Eve and so forth. So we know that, you know, man was able to. And my question, too, is this you know, evolutionists say that man evolved from apes. If that's the case, then why are apes still here? I mean, they don't ever have answers for any of these questions. You know, they say, well, just some of them just, okay, well, why did that one decide to become a man, but this one decided to stay an ape? I mean, not a very smart ape, then, if he had a chance to become a man. I mean, it's just, you know, if you think about this stuff logically, then, you know, if something became something, 
what, what it all turned into, the other thing should be gone. You know, that's implied for anything that they're trying to, to say, but that's not the case. <clears throat> now, God blessed his creation of man in verse 28, just as he did the animals, and said to reproduce and to have dominion over the earth and to subdue it. Now, man had to learn about the earth and creation in order to subdue it. And this is why true science was founded. Now, unfortunately, most of science has been taken over by Satan, though there are some Christian science ministries that still seek God and true science as found in Scripture. Now, unfortunately, like I said, they try to hush them all up and stuff, so, uh, you know, they're... They try to keep them silent, you know, the, the evolutionists. But the fact that God said to be, quote, be fruitful and multiply or replenish the earth, you see that in verse 28 of the first chapter of Genesis, shows that the earth is not overpopulated as many try to say today. You know, God never said to reproduce until the world's population reaches a certain number. You know, right now, we're at about 8 billion people. And many people, I mean, I've heard even a lot of Christians say, yes, we're overpopulated. No, there are many places on this earth where nobody even lives. They're very sparse and so forth. Even right here in the United States, there's places, you go out in Montana and different places, it's very sparse. We're not overpopulated. God, like I said, God didn't say, keep reproducing until the population got 8 billion, then stop. Or when it reaches whatever number. You know, many of these, I've mentioned it before, but it, it's just... I'm going to, well, I'll mention it here in a second here, but, um, you know, man, many today disobey God's word and want the population lowered by killing off man. You know, China was even trying to do that with the one, one child policy and of the ones, different ones have tried to do that. And, you know, and oftentimes it was the girls that got killed off. If they knew it was going to be a female child, they'd kill it off because they're like, well, if I only have one child, unfortunately they wanted to have a man. So... You know, a lot, of, a lot of what would have been girls were, were dying off. In fact, China has that problem today where they have over 200 million males that can never get married because there aren't enough girls in that nation because they've killed off so many of them. Now, one group, as I mentioned before, wants the world population down to 500 million. And as I said, we're at 8 billion. And they went down to 500 million. Now there's a monument in Georgia that is known as the Georgia Guidestones that was put in place by those seeking the New World Order that mentions this. You, you know, you can actually look online or do whatever, see pictures of it, and it has on this monument are the ten new commandments of the New World Order. Instead of having the ten commandments like God gave us. There's Ten Commandments on there, but it's their new Ten Commandments of what the New World Order is. With the 500 million people of the population being the First Commandment, that First Commandment says we need to get the world population down to 500 million. Now to get this low, they must find a way to kill all people, such as the recent, what I call the pandemic. Others say that there's 2 billion or so for the world population, but you know, again, they either have to start wars, have some kind of diseases or something, and that's what they're doing. They're going around and they're coming up with these things, and I'm telling you right now, I, you know, I'm not predicting that, I'm just telling you it's going to be a fact. They'll come up with something else very soon. I don't know what it'll call or what the it'll be, but I personally believe COVID-19 was one of those things that they were testing it to try to get rid of people. And they're going to come up with something else down the road. You know, they're also eventually they're going to be starting to try to have more wars and stuff too. Because like I said, they're always trying to get rid of people. In fact, if you remember, even when they first came out with Obamacare, there's a lot of stuff hidden inside there that talks about basically getting rid of the elderly. You know, that, oh, we're going to refuse medical, medical uh, care and so forth. That when you reach a certain age, that we'll just stop giving you any, any kind of care. And you'll die off because they're trying to get rid of the older people. You know, people people don't want to hear this, but it, it's the truth. If you look at this stuff, and it's not just our government. That's what I'm saying. It, it's all over the world. You know, but something has to happen if they want to get the population down to 500 million or 2 billion. They have to find a way to get rid of people. 
you know, and as I mentioned already, China had the trying to limit the number of children born. That just as a nation, and, and, you know, that's exactly what a nation would do that has rejected God's word. You know, China has thrown God out for many, many years now, with all the communism and so forth. You know, they're, they're atheistic. And, you know, God's been thrown out of the picture. And once you start throwing God out of the picture, this is exactly the kind of stuff that happens, is you start saying we need to kill off a child or so forth. But, you know, America isn't so innocent either. You know, we've killed off over 69 million babies, you know, by abortion. And it more and more happen every day. So, you know, we always quick to blame China and some, you know, India and some of these other nations. But, you know, America needs to repent of our own sins. We've got, we've got plenty of uh, our own answering to do to God. And God will punish us for that someday. Now, Genesis, let's look at verses uh, 29 through 31 of that first chapter of Genesis. Verse 29 says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, and the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for me, and to every beast of the earth, and every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for me, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now these verses clearly show that originally both man and animals were created to be herbivores and only eat plants. You know, in other words, they are vegetarians. That's what originally all animals as well as man was originally created, was to be vegetarians or herbivores. Now just because, as I mentioned this before, but some animals have scary looking teeth does not mean that God created them for meat. You know, I mentioned about the panda bears having big teeth in order to break apart the bamboo, but they do not eat meat. And there's, you know, a lot of fossils they found of certain dinosaurs or so forth or whatever, or even there's other animals even alive today that people, all, they always automatically assume because they got these ferocious looking teeth that they have to be man eaters or a meat eater, for that, sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking, <laughs> I was thinking of, <laughs> I've been watching Shark Week, so you know. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> anyway, you know, <laughs> meat eaters, but then, you know, when they really start studying and they find out that they're actually vegetarians. So, you know, again, you know, the, people try to assume something when it's not. Now, let's go over, just hold your place there, but look at Genesis chapter 9, verse 3. You know, it wasn't until after the flood that man was allowed to eat meat, and this verse shows this. Genesis chapter 9, verse 3. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. You know, and I used to work with this guy, he was from Korea, North, uh, South Korea. And, you know, he would, we were talking about eating different things, and he's like, over there, oh yeah, anything that moves, we eat it. Well, that's exactly what this verse says. If it moves, it lives, you eat it, it's your meat. And some people literally take that. I mean, he said, you know, over there, they actually raise rats and stuff like that to eat. You know, that. They eat, like you said, if it moves, they eat it. And I hope I don't ever get that hungry to have to eat one, but, you know, I guess it was either that or star. But anyway, these verses again show that we should eat the seeds as God knew they contained the vitamins. I mentioned this before too, but these seeds contain the vitamins that we need. And at the end of day six, God saw that everything he had made was very good as now he had created man, his prized creation as he was made in God's image. You know, and I'm going to continue on with that in a second, but as I mentioned, you know, I'll just briefly bring it up again, but like I said, these seeds, you know, it tells you to eat the seeds and so forth. And, you know, and it's been shown that a lot of our vitamins come from that, and that's why I say it. That's why originally for a long time, man didn't have all the diseases we have now. Because, again, I think that's, you know, goes back to kind of this New World Order stuff. And I'm not saying that everybody that says this is part of that. It's just that part of it, they've been brainwashed because of their teaching in college, you know, medical school and so forth. But they, 
you know, always tell people, oh, don't eat the seeds or don't do this. You know, try to avoid vitamins. You know, anytime you, you talk to most physicians and you say, well, I try to do things naturally. Oh, no, just take this pill. Just do this. They always want to try to get, get you to take a pill or do something when, you know, God has a lot of natural cures out there. If we would just learn to read God's word and believe God's word and accept it. And, you know, that's why a lot of people never had a lot of things for a long time. You know, a lot of the stuff's more modern. I think that Satan's gotten in there where he's infiltrated this stuff to try to brainwash people into believing that, oh, we don't need to have this stuff because God told us to have it. And that's why it's getting rejected. But anyway, as I said, that man was God's prized creation because he was made in God's image. Now, many theologians, as I mentioned, said, I mentioned this well ago, but said Satan rebelled prior to these six days of creation. And that he had previously ruled the earth. Now again, this is completely unscriptural. I already stated that Satan sinned by rebelling against God because Adam was made in the image of God. And was to have dominion over the whole earth. And Satan was jealous and wanted it for himself and to be like God. Now if Satan had sinned prior to the creation of man, God would never have said at the end of the creation week that all was very good as sin is never good, let alone very good. You know, and if you go back and look at verse 31 there, it says, And God saw that every, saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Well, everything that he made would include Satan himself and all the fallen, what would become the fallen angels. Again, why would he say it was very good if they had already had fallen and already sinned? You know, I believe this happened afterwards. Now, I don't think it was... You know, there was a long time afterwards, you know, after the, you know, God rested and day, you know, it could have been day eight, day nine, who knows, I don't know, I don't think it was a huge amount of time. And then it wasn't long after that, that's when probably Eve got corrupted. You know, I don't think they were walking around their perfect bodies too long before sin entered the picture. But, you know, scripture doesn't say how long, but we do know. They weren't around, they, you know, they didn't reproduce and have a child yet, so, you know, I don't think it was a super long time. Now let's look at, uh, start looking at uh, Genesis chapter 2. We'll look at the first verse. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. Now this first verse of chapter 2 shows God had completed his creation. This shows that nothing new is being created today, despite evolutionists that say stars are still being formed today. You know, again, that is, that is, that is incorrect. God completed all his creation at the end of these six days, and then he rested on that seventh day. There's nothing new being, being recreated or being created or anything today. You know, things do change. I mentioned that, like I said, animals will adapt and so forth. You know, I mentioned that microevolution. That's adaptation. You know, animals will adapt. Like you see, like say, Australia is a good example. They have a lot of unique animals down there. The kangaroo, the, the, the panda, I mean not the panda, the, the koala bear, and so forth. Because they're a little more isolated. But it's not evolution. That's adaptation, or as I said, you know, microevolution where... Birds will, you know, you'll have different type of finches and so forth in, in different areas. Like Hawaii is another one because it's all islands. They have a lot of unique animals over there. But it's just that they adapted to their environment because they were stuck on this island. That's all that is. But, there's, you know, stars are not still being, re you know, not being created. You know, they always talk about, you know, scientists say, well, this here is a picture of what it's a star forming over here. Or this one, you know, yeah. so forth. No. There's no new stars forming. God created all the stars on day four. However many there are, that's how many. There's never going to be another new star created. You know, this first also says the proper heavens, since now that the week was completed, there were now three heavens from one. You know, again, this proves that Genesis 1 is correct in saying heaven and not heavens. You know, I mentioned that before when we were back in Genesis chapter 1. That these other Bibles try to change Genesis 1-1 one, one to in the beginning God created the heavens. You know, he created the heaven and then we saw it got divided during the week into the three heavens. But originally it was just one heaven. 
And then God proves that by this very first verse in Genesis 2 where it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Now that it was finished, he didn't have one heaven, he had the three heavens. So therefore it says heavens. Looking at verse 2 and 3 of chapter 2. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now God rested on the seventh and last day of the creation week and sanctified it to make it holy. God was not tired and did not need rest. He rested to set the pattern for the seven day week and for the seventh day being the Sabbath day or a day of rest for the Jews as well as all people. You know, many people have tried, I mentioned it before, but they'll try to change this, the week and so forth, but our bodies are designed by God to rejuvenate themselves on the seventh day. In fact, science has even proven that our heart actually beats at a slower rate on the seventh day because our bodies are designed to slow down and rejuvenate themselves, the brain cells kind of get fixed up and so forth, you know, that no matter what, you know, you can try to keep working, but, you know, that's going to do you in. Your body needs rest. Let's look at uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, and we'll see that about the, the Sabbath day. Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So see again, we clearly see that that seventh day was blessed by God, was made a holy day, and it also shows He clearly made everything in heaven, on earth, and in the sea, all within that six days. So again, I, I, I repeat it, but I just, I'm just i trying to make this point. That includes Satan, who is a created being. Now, originally the seventh day would have been Saturday, which is what, why the Jews had their Sabbath on, this, on Saturday. They still do to this day. But us as Christians, we now rest on the first day of the week, or in other words, Sunday, instead of the seventh, because our Lord rose from the grave on that first day. And that's why we, we do that. You know, God just said he had a rest one day a week. And, you know, it started, we now changed it to now we, we worship on Sunday because that's when the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the grave. And we do that to honor him. You know, it said God just demands that a person works six days and rest one day a week. So, you know, these people say, well, no, we're really supposed to be worshiping on the Sabbath, I mean, on the Sabbath, on the Saturday, you know, you actually have your Seventh-day Adventist, but you also have Seventh-day Baptist. There's Baptist. I mean, there's other ones, too. There's, uh, the fact, there's a church, I can't remember the name, but right over nearby us um, on the county roads, the uh, County Road 318, where it actually has, you know, they have the Saturday services as well and stuff. It's a United Church of Christ or something like that. I don't remember what it is, but, but there's actually a, a, a division of Baptists that are Seventh-day Baptists that, you know, they, they still follow that where they, they feel they have to worship on and on. I, I think, I personally think they're wrong. Now, I'm not going to sit here and if someone chooses to worship on Saturday or whatever, but I just, I think they're, they're, they're not really following through what, what, is, what God has us. You know, I think it's more important that we honor the resurrection of Jesus because the Sabbath was really made for the Jews, not necessarily for the Gentiles. The Gentiles were never ordered that they had to necessarily celebrate that. And, and you know, us here are Gentiles. There's, you know, there are Jews, there are Christians, but they're the minority. Now, as I mentioned, our bodies are designed by God to rejuvenate themselves on the seventh day. You know, and I mentioned this before, but I think it's worth repeating that some nations such as France, after the French Revolution, tried a 10-day week because they were trying to remove God from society. 
You know, they turned into a socialistic nation. Once they killed off the king after the French Revolution, they immediately turned into a socialistic nation. And they tried immediately to make everybody atheists and get rid of the, uh, God. They were, they were even trying to get rid of Roman Catholicism. Now, you guys know that I don't believe Roman Catholicism is true Christianity. But in their minds, it was they were even trying to get rid of that Christianity. You know, that, that went on for a little while. I don't remember how long, but it didn't last real long because it failed as their bodies needed rest. Now, Russia also tried this and failed after, in 1917, when they had the Bolshevik Re Revolution. Again, they were communists and anti-God, atheists, they threw God out. And this is one of the ways that they wanted to throw God out. You know, people even today, they do that when, you know, we have B.C. on our calendars, we have B.C. and A.D., B.C. for before Christ, you know, before the birth of Christ. It's actually off by a couple of years or so, you know, but it was intended to be, you know, up to the birth of Jesus. And then the A.D. stands, is Latin for Anno Domino, which means in the year of our Lord. You know, in this case right now, we're in the year of our Lord, 2021. Now, again, like I said, I think it's off by a couple of years or so because uh, they had the birth off a little bit. But that's what it, what those mean. Now, there's a lot of people nowadays that are trying to change it so that it's BCE or uh, which stands for before the common era and then CE for common era. They're getting rid of the AD because they want to try to say, you know, that, that we live in. There was BCE before the common era or, or CE the common era. But the thing is, they still have the same division as what we have for BC and AD. They just changed the terminology. But you can't get away from the fact that everything, it, it still revolves around the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you can always try to throw God out. But ultimately, no matter what you do, you can't get rid of God. Because, like I said, you're going to always have to go back to that seven-day week because that's the way it was designed. And it's the same thing with the calendar. You can change names, do whatever, do whatever. You know, like the Muslims have their own calendar based off of Muhammad and so forth. But, you know, for those that try to use, like, the calendar like we have, like I said, you can change the terminology, but you're not changing the fact that it's still based off of the birth of Jesus. You know, they, they just think people are ignorant or stupid or something. I don't know, but, I mean... It, like I said, it's just, again, people trying to throw out God. You know, as I said, God made the seventh day holy since this was the day set aside to worship God. You know, people should not be working on the Sabbath if they can avoid it. Now, I understand certain occupations, you know, if you're a fireman or a policeman or something like that. You know, doctor, you know, physicians, nurses, and so forth. Certain things you, you sometimes you're required. You know, you know, me as a pastor, I'm working on the set on, on, on what we would call the Sabbath. Thing is, though, it's not really the true Sabbath. The true Sabbath is really still Saturday. But you know, it's the Lord's Day. That's what Christians celebrate is the Lord's Day, not the Sabbath. As I said, Sabbath is still technically still really is Saturday. We don't really celebrate the Sabbath. We celebrate the Lord's Day. And as I said, there are sometimes, you know, Christians do have to work. But if at all possible, we should try not to work. I mean, there's many people who try to use that excuse. Well, I can't go to church because i got to work. Well, I'm sure if you really wanted to get off, you probably could if you be bad enough. Or go find another job. Now, like I said, I'm not sitting here. But I'm just telling you that there are some people that purposely... So they can avoid avoid church, avoid God. And again, we want to not work so that we can have it set aside for the purpose of worshiping God. And also so we can have that rest. You know, not working on the Sabbath should not be the extreme of like Orthodox Jews. As they will not even turn on a light switch since they say that is work. You know, they'll actually hire people to have them go and turn on a light switch for them on the Sabbath because they consider it work if they would actually turn on a light switch. You know, you know, Jesus had this whole point. That's why he would, you know, he performed. That's the whole reason why Jesus showed over and over that, that, that 
That was never the purpose of the Sabbath. It should not control us. You know, the Sabbath, it should not be one of those things like, oh, it's the Sabbath coming up again because now I can't do anything. And that's why Jesus, over and over, he performed miracles on the Sabbath. He did it over and over. You see, he constantly, on, on the Sabbath, he would perform a miracle. You know, the Jews were not to do the everyday work, but they still need to eat or turn on lights. You know, it doesn't mean that we can't cook some food, or a Jew or whoever can't cook food or turn on a light. It just, as I said, we don't go out. I mean, I've heard Christians even say that, you know, Baptists even, well, I go out to eat on Sunday because, you know, I don't even cook because, you know, we're not supposed to do anything. Okay, but now you're making those people have to work. So I guess it's okay for them to have to work as long as you don't work. So you're just being selfish and worried about yourself, basically. But that's not what, what they're saying. God didn't say we have to eat. God's not saying that we can't go out and eat or we can't, you can't cook yourself at home. You know, we have to eat. God didn't say we can't turn on a light switch. Again, it's just when you, you don't purposely, the everyday work, whatever you do, you should be avoiding doing it on the Lord's Day so that you can worship God and use it to get some rest. You know, the Jews made it, as I said, so that the Sabbath became dreaded as they did not want to violate any man-made added rules. God just did not want them doing their normal work, as I said, so they'd have time to worship Him. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. If you want to turn to Mark chapter 2, verse 27, we'll take a look at that. You know, and like I said, that that was, I mean, I, I'm i sure that's exactly how a lot of Jews felt. That they felt, and even probably today, like the ultra-Orthodox, that, that uh, the Sabbath is coming. And it's like, oh, great. You know, we, we I, I look forward to the Lord's Day, and I hope each and every one of you do too. Because we can come worship the Lord Jesus. But, I'll get to that first in just a second here. But the thing is... They made it so it was a nightmare that, you know, they had so many regulations that they, they, they couldn't, they were trying not to follow that it was dreaded that, oh, you know, I can't do anything. They couldn't, you know, walk a certain amount and do this and do that. But like I said, it should not be that way. Let's look at Mark chapter 2, verse 27. And he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking now, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. As I said, we should look forward to a day of rest and worship of Jesus. Another meaning of the seven day week is God was showing how long the earth would last before he returned to set up a day of rest and his millennial kingdom. Now, I might have a lesson on this sometime in the future or whatever, but the, law, the short version of it is that each day represents a thousand years in our time with four days or four thousand years before the birth of Jesus and then two more days in God's time or two thousand years in our time actually years of 360 days not 365 because biblical years are 360 days not 365 before there be you know those two days or two thousand years it says the birth of Jesus before Jesus returns to earth for the final seventh day of rest. That, that seventh day, or that, that would be the thousand year millennial reign. And I believe we are close to the start of the seventh day in God's calendar. So in other words, like I said, there were six days of creation and the seventh day of rest. And I believe, and I think there's other scripture to back it up, which I'm not going to get in tonight. Like I said, sometime I might have a lesson on that in the future. But I think that was another example that God was trying to give us that each day represented a thousand years of our time. When that sixth day ends, whenever it is, you know, we think is we don't really know the exact time, as I said, when Jesus was born. We have different different opinions and stuff, you know, there's a couple of years vary here and there. But we all know that it's getting close to the time of Jesus' return. And I believe once that sixth day ends, 
That'll be it. And then, like I said, then you'll have the seventh day, which will be the rest, which is what we know as the Millennial Kingdom. Then after that, that's when you'll have the new heaven, new earth. We won't have time anymore and all that. And I think, you know, God was like Chet, he was trying to give us a clue. You know, he was trying to, that was another sign to tell the people that Jesus was going to come. He was going to be born at the start of what would be the fifth day. You know, there was four days that would pass, and at the start of the fifth day, he'd be born, then he'd be around for two days. You know, there's verses even in, like, the Gospel of John and so forth. Like I said, I'm not going to get too much in it, because I might have a lesson on it. And it's a little bit, little bit more complex, but there's, there's verses in there where he talks about, you know, Jesus even says, and after two days, you know. And there, you know, a lot of things in Scripture have multiple meanings. They'll have that spiritual meaning where it literally means in God's eyes the two days or two thousand years, but it also meant literally like two days from now, like like Friday, like today's Wednesday, two days from now would be Friday. So there are a lot of things that have more than one meaning in Scripture, and I think this is one of those cases where it's set it up for that seven day week that we have, with the seventh day being the Sabbath for rest. But I also believe it set it up for the the length of the earth. Let's look at one more verse here, and we'll close with this before we um, get any farther. If you want to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. And it shows you what I was talking about, about the thousand years in a day. Now, there's also a verse in Psalm that mentions the same thing, but we won't look at that one. But let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Yeah, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, and then 2 Peter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, chapter 3, verse 8. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So, you know, in God's eyes... Every thousand years, to him, it's just one day. You know, and I mentioned that before, how, you know, and I'll, I'm going to mention it again when we get to it, but, you know, I believe that, you know, they always say that, well, Adam didn't really, you know, he lived to be 900, uh, 938 years old, I think it was, or something like that, 900 and something. I'd have to look it up again, but anyway... But in God's eyes, he still died. Because it says, remember it said that, you know, on the day you eat of that fruit, you would die. You know, and everybody says, well, he died spiritually. Well, they're right. He did die spiritually at that moment. But in God's eyes, he still also physically died on that day. Because in God's eyes, he never ate it to day two. He was still on day one, you know, in God's eyes. Because he didn't live to be a thousand years. And like I said, I'm going to mention that again when we get to that. But uh, we're going to stop here right now unless anybody's got any questions or anything we're going to have a word of prayer okay. Father we thank you again tonight to allow us to have this Bible study we just thank you for the people that were able to, to attend we just continue to pray for those that are not able to be here we just pray Lord for each and every one here in this church we thank you for your son Jesus what he did for us on Calvary we just pray now for safety for each and every one as they go home tonight. Pray for safe return on Sunday. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.